to you some of the finals uh, and some of the history uh, about the Igbo people. Uh, in this presentation, which I will title A Call to the Igbo, I think uh, an introduction will be good at this time. My name is Elo, Elo Chuku, and I am Igbo. My father is Igbo, my mother is Igbo. And one of the good things about my growing up is I had an eyewitness to the original Igbo traditions because my father is a chief. In his palace, he did demonstrate some of the Igbo tradition, which I had to see as a young man growing up. Um, so that gives me an edge. And when I became aware that these traditions which I had witnessed with my father are the same traditions that are in the Old Testament. I begin to align, there was a lot of parallel. So that gives me an honor um, to say that the Igbos have kept their father's tradition, which they have taken from the land of Israel into the modern day Niger area. I thank God who gave me the opportunity to be here with you today to share this because uh, naturally um, someone like me doing this it's a miracle in itself. So uh, without wasting time let's get into the presentation. If you have any questions please feel free to ask questions. Um, from what I understand this will be aired online so you can be able to watch this over the internet. Uh, if you have any comment, those who are watching online, please email the questions in and we'll be able to address the questions. Uh, please do give some time for us to process the information and get back to you because the team is very few. So we'll need some time to process things and get back to you accordingly. But we will do so hopefully in time. A call to the evil. Um, we have previously tried to explain how the word able became evil and then became evil today. As I've explained previously in the presentations, the call to the evil, the word evil has no meaning in the African language of the evil people. That created the quest to discover who the people are, who called them the name, what did they call themselves, who their father were, and what did their father call themselves. When you discover the evil ancestry of those of the family of Jacob, you begin to understand why the word evil and how it was mistranslated by the Europeans when they came to Africa. I understand because some of the Hebrew words are very difficult for non-Hebrew speakers. With that said, I would like to give a quote from a brilliant Igbo professor, Professor Chinyo Achebe. Um, he's an author of a bestseller, Things Fall Apart. In his quotation, he says this, proverb, he says, until the lion tell his side of the story. The tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. 
The background to that is the Africans have never been given the opportunity to share their own story. In fact, we have read many Europeans say the Africans had no history. There's no reading history. That is. And the irony of that is this, or the irony in that rather is this. Those who say this have a copy of the Bible. Yes, they are so-called Christians. If they but look into the Bible and understand these are one of the same people that are in the Bible. So I will tell you that the Bible is a collection of African history. African people. People say, why do you say this? Because they are Israelite. That is correct. They are Israelite. But where did they come from? They came as a nation out of Pharaoh Egypt, which is an African nation. So when you refer to Israelite, think African people, because they were birthed as a nation in Egypt. They went the family of 70 and they came out a nation of over 2 million people into the land of Canaan. It is important. People ask, where did they go after the destruction? This is the point of our presentation to correct some of the distorted histories, to explain what went wrong, where it went wrong. Some of the things that were done were done out of ignorance or lack of understanding or probably, for lack of a better word, prejudice among the writers. Mongol Park wrote, I found the Negroes to be in possession of the ancient scroll, the book of Moses, the Psalms, Isaiah, and these are of high value, value to the price of a slave, prime slave. So they cherish their Torah. When you hear the Europeans brought the Christ religion to Africa, it is incomplete information. The people knew their God. They knew who they were. For example, the Asante, the Asante high priest, wore the breastplate of the high priest and a gold plate on his forehead that said holiness to Yahweh who taught the Africans this name when the Europeans did not know God as Yahweh the Africans did I will further go to tell you this that the entire west coast of Africa are nothing less than the children of Israel after the kingdom failed in Judah, in Jerusalem, King Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the, 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 the kingdom of Judah and put up his own puppet kings. These were the people that the royal family killed in the land of Israel and rushed into Africa for the fear of his vengeance because they knew the king of Babylon would get his share of revenge. Let's pick this up from the book of Kings. So I will open up 2 Kings 24, verse 1, and it says, In his days Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. But to show you that the people killed his puppet kings and ran into Africa, we picked that up on 2 Kings 25. And it reads, but it came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Netaniah, the son of Elishama, of the seed royal, that's the royal family, came and ten men with him and smote Gedaliah, who is puppet king for Nebuchadnezzar, that he died, and the Jews and the Chaldees that were with him at Mizpah, and all the people, both small and great, and the captain of the armies arose and came into Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldees or the Chaldeans. So you see that the royal family killed the puppet kings 
and rush into Africa. So they run into Africa to join their brothers who are already there, who are already staying there. If you look carefully in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah explains this. A group of them came later, some of the remnants who were left in the land after the book came back and restored another ruling class. They came to inquire of Jeremiah, please seek the Lord on our behalf, ask if he will protect us in Africa. And Jeremiah came back with the word of the Lord and told the people, do not go to Africa because your heart is set on it. Stay in the land, I will protect you. But they deny what he was telling them, and they ran into Africa. And God promised that these bunch would not make it. But the first bunch who went, we believe they were in their millions, survived till this day. And they are the ones who built these powerful empires in Africa, like King Hafo of Judah. Let's go to Judah for a minute. King Hafon had about 44 wives. Solomon had about a thousand of them. You see, it's an African thing. Uh, even, even today, people that are men who have 30 to 40 wives. I don't see Europeans doing that. <laughs> no, they don't do that. I make a small joke. Uh, when somebody asked me, you are Igbo, I said, yes. He said, you don't have a big nose. And I said, were we supposed to have a big nose? If we did, that would add to the circumcised the nose. But we did not. <laughs> now what are you thinking? King Hafon was a very powerful king in the West Africa, the king of Judah. And he was pro-European. The Portuguese loved him. There was even fight between Europeans who would trade with this king because he was famous, he was very wealthy. Before 1884, before Africa was torn into pieces and all the names were changed, these powerful kings were ruling people. Even the empowered of Asante, the king of Asante, very wealthy king. These are ancient Israelite families. The history of Africa has not been told yet because he holds a lot of power to the truth. Be it for political reasons, be it for religious reasons, I don't know. But it has not been told. As I said earlier, the proverb from Professor Chino Achebe, until the lion can tell his story. The glory of the heart will glorify the hunter. When King Dahomey, King of Dahomey, Ajayda, conquered Judah, he annexed the form. Now, what you don't know is Dahomey is also an Israelite kingdom. So they did not kill the people, they only absorbed the people into their power. They were expanding their kingdoms. So the people remain in the land till this day. Even the capital in Benin is still called Oida, which is the French name for Judah. In Cameroon, it's called Yaounde. The kingdom of Judah, which the Portuguese changed its name to call Ayuda. The French called Oida or Oida. So when you hear these names, Oida, Oida, Judah, Ayuda, they are the same people the Kingdom of Judah in West Africa. About the Igbos, the Igbos are a mixed tribe. We understand today that most family in the, among the Igbos are the God family. Because Eri and his brothers moved to the River Niger area and settled there. Eri built an altar, 12 stone altar, and called upon the name of the Lord, Yahweh. And then settle with his brothers. The question I always get is this why did Eri not call the Igbos Gadites? Well, it's important to understand. 
They did not move alone. They moved with all the tribes because there was commingling. Remember what I said, when the kingdom failed, there was commingling of the tribes. There was a northern kingdom, there was a southern kingdom. But the people who commingled knew where they come from. They knew their ancestors. But the covenant for them will be able people. One more point you have to understand is this. The ancient Israelites did not call themselves Israelites. And the ancient Hebrew is not the same with the Hebrew spoken today in the land of Israel. It suffice to say, if Moses were to come and walk down the street of Jerusalem today, and you would speak to him this modern Hebrew, he would have no idea what you're talking about. Or if you call him Hebrew, he wouldn't understand. Because they were not called by their name. The name Hebrew came from the Latin. When the English borrowed that word and translated this word into Hebrew, so the word became today known as Hebrew. Hebrew became Hebrew. Any questions on that? Ancient Hebrew writings. When they discover the Qumran scroll, you can see very clearly that the ancient Hebrew is very different from the Hebrew that is written today. So the Bible was written different from that which is spoken today. When Christ was on the earth, the common language was Greek for the people. Hebrew was there, but it was not well spoken. Most scriptures were written in Greek. After the exile, the language of the ancient Hebrew became corrupted, per se. It was not well spoken anymore. And when the Romans took over in their own time, they had translated all the documents, all the ancient documents, into Latin. So when the English came to power, they borrowed from that which the Romans had written. And the same happened when the Greeks wrote their own documents. But the New Testament, as we understand it today, were written in Greek. And when they made quotations of the Bible, it was quoted from Septuagint, which is also a Greek translation of the Old Testament. The language of the Hebrews, it's important to understand, as I said earlier, the language of the Hebrews have ancient Hebrew embedded into it. You probably heard me give this example before, but I will give it here again. When God made Moses by the burning bush, God said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, tell him to let my people go. Then Moses asked the Lord, Yahweh, What name shall I tell the people who you are? What name shall I tell them who sent me? Moses, of course, knew what the name of God is. All Hebrew know the name of the Lord. But he was asking for a name to tell the people because they've been praying to God for many, many years without any response. But this time he responded. But to convince the people, that he is one and the same God, the God of their fathers. Abiyama, Isiaku, and the Ikobi. These are the Igbo names for these patriarchs. Today they are called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Please bear in mind, J was not in the ancient scriptures. It is a much later uh, alphabet that was added. So Jacob would not have been the right word. And that also goes for the name of God, which is called Jehovah today. Jehovah could not be the name of God because J was not in the time of ancient scriptures. 
Then God told Moses, I am that I am. Tell the children of Israel that I am sent you. Now the Hebrew of that is this. I am that I am in Hebrew is a higher shah, a higher. In Igbo language today, Ahaya is the same word for his name. There are more examples like this that can be cut out. So I believe that the ancient Hebrew is preserved in the modern Igbo language that is spoken today in the land of Nigeria. I will give an example. There was an author who wrote a book, um, Oluda Ikwano. They know him as Olauda Ikwana. But he told you what his name meant in Igbo, so we know it's Oluda Ikwana. He wrote the bestseller, the interesting narrative of Olauda Ikwana. And he explained that he was born in the land of the Abel, a land called Abel, in 1745. And if you look through the slave documents, they refer to people as Abel or Abel. So they were still quite close. Why Abel or Abel? If you understand the common ancestor of the Israelite, of ancient Israelite, is Heber or Heber. The people call themselves after this ancestor, Abel, as in plural, the people, which is some word Igbo means. Igbo means the people. They say Nibo, when Yah. And Yah is the name of God. So when they say Ibo Quen, the word they respond with, Yah, is also the name of God. And also all Ibo names include those of Maya, Keneya, Donuya. And Yah is abbreviation for God's name Yahweh. Remember, Judah. Yahuda. This is also a part of God's name embedded in the people's name. And God also said that the people bear my name. The people that are called by my name, if they will humble themselves, repent from their wicked ways, and pray, and I will hear from heaven and will heal their land. It is important the purple bear his name.